I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Agricultural Water Part 1. In this first of a two-part series on agricultural water, we will identify risks that impact food safety related to water sources. This webinar is part of a series of food safety webinars coordinated and conducted by the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative to help Native American farmers, ranchers, and food producers to begin to understand the importance of food safety and what is necessary to reach compliance under the Food Safety Modernization Act. Today's presentation is made possible through the three-year cooperative agreement between the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the IFAI to provide Native American outreach, training, technical assistance, and education to ensure compliance with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Stay up to date on upcoming in-person trainings and future webinar opportunities at nativefoodsafety.org. All, all attendees will be muted during the presentations. Attendees can submit a question via the question box and it will be answered with a follow-up follow email from the presenter at a later time. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Josiah Griffin. Hey, thank you, Nikki. Aloha Keku, everyone. Um, my name is Josiah Griffin. I am Native Hawaiian and I am a program and policy specialist with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. Um, as Nikki indicated, um, today we are looking to discuss um, one part of a two-part series, um, particularly focusing on agricultural water. So before we really get into the meat of agricultural water, um, the first thing that I'd like to let everyone know as a reference is that on March 18th, 2019, the Food and Drug Administration released a rule indicating that compliance for agricultural water provisions other than sprouts uh, would be postponed for a given period of time. So for farms with annual produce sales, again, this is other than sprouts, of over $500,000, that compliance start date would be um, 2022. For farms with an annual produce sale other than sprouts, making um, between 250 to 500,000, the compliance start date is 2023. And for those with an annual produce sale under 250,000, um, dollars, the compliance start date is 2024. So before we exit out and say, okay, we're done, we don't have to worry about it for another three years, there are a number of reasons why I would encourage you to just stick around. Um, the first is that the information that's provided here today is part of um, good agricultural practices that are widely recognized across the industry, including by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The second is that for those of you who are interested in working through a commercial market, um, the commercial, uh, the, the in industries that you might be looking to work with uh, may also require these standards to be implemented at a um, more expedited time frame. But the third, um, generally speaking, is that it's helpful to get a sense of where the final rule is now for the Food Safety Modernization Act, so that you can begin to think how to implement these practices in your own um, produce operations currently. So as Nikki indicated, there are two sections that um, the Food Safety Modernization Act largely focuses on in terms of agricultural water. Part one is what we'll primarily be discussing today is focusing on production water. Um, by that mean, we mean uh, water used in contact with produce during growth, and I'll get into a little bit more of what that means. Um, part two, we'll discuss at a later date uh, for post-harvest water, so stay tuned for that. So when we're talking about agricultural water, we all know that water is a standard um, use for um, growing uh, produce no matter what kind of fruit or vegetable production that you're looking to enter or you're maintaining. Um, agricultural water is a little bit different and so whenever you see the um, symbol icon in the bottom right, um, this symbol indicates that it is a provision material that comes directly from the Food Safety Modernization Act. So I'd encourage you to pay close attention to these slides. So in terms of the produce safety rule under FSMA, um, it states that all agricultural water must be safe and of adequate sanitary quality standards for its intended use. That applies to both parts one, which again we'll discuss today, and part two, um, 
So what do we actually mean when we're talking about agricultural water? So agricultural water, um, broadly speaking, um, is any water that's used for covered activities on covered produce where water is intended to or is likely to contact covered produce or food contact surfaces. So that, to me, reads um, that there are some technical terms that we're referencing here. So when we're actually looking at um, covered um, produce, um, it may also be helpful to reframe covered produce as what covered produce isn't. So covered produce isn't under FSMA, um, produce that's really, cons excuse me, um, produce that is really consumed raw, and the Food um, Drug Administration has an exhaustive list of what those, of what FDA considers those produce items to be. Um, covered produce is not produce for personal or on-farm consumption. It's not produce that is part of a, or generally considered a raw agricultural commodity. And covered produce is not produce de uh, destined for commercial processing or washing. So looking at agricultural water, um, we'll be discussing a number of key objectives. Um, the first is to identify what agricultural water is and to be able to identify the impacts of microbial safety from these water sources. Um, you might hear me use pathogen or pathogenic interchangeably with microbial safety um, for our discussion. Um, our objectives include also describing practices such as water application methods and timings that can be used to reduce risks associated with microbial um, entities in your water sources or during the application process. Um, provide tips um, to help you adopt practices that might limit some of these impacts um, to the environment, soil quality, and wildlife. Describe the importance of water testing. Um, describe FDA's agricultural water quality criteria. And again, while this compliance dates um, for um, farm operations are set for the future, um, the water quality criteria are something that are likely to remain consistent and are currently in place based on the final rule to describe actions that could be taken if agricultural water related risks are identified in your operation and to identify records necessary to document agricultural water quality and use. Um, record keeping is incredibly important for your agricultural operations and particularly as it relates to um, provisions in the Food Safety Modernization Act and we'll continue to touch on that. So as we're looking at agricultural water, um, we have an initial example. So in this example, the water source that's being used for the operation comes from a pond. Um, the crop uh, that is that we are looking to grow is squash. Um, the water would be um, used through irrigation um, and applied overhead. So the question that we have just to get this kicked off is, is this agricultural water? So the first question that we have to answer is, is this crop covered produce? So for summer squash, yes, and for winter squash, no. And that also goes back to whether or not the crop is traditionally eaten raw. We're generally eaten raw. Um, so the second question is, is a direct application method used? So yes, here we find that because the water is intended to or is likely to contact the covered produce, it would be considered, for our purposes, agricultural water, assuming that we're talking about a covered produce item. So we have another question, um, looking at potatoes um, for an overhead irrigation um, water distribution method. So is this agricultural water? And the question is no, um, for a couple of different reasons, primarily of which potatoes are generally not eaten raw. Um, so there is an additional kill step associated with that. Um, but uh, included in that is also the question of um, whether or not we would generally see direct application or contact. So there are many factors um, that we have to consider when we're looking at production water. Um, one is the quality of the water that we're actually looking at. Um, two, and this is something that we'll discuss more in depth, is the source that you're actually getting the water from. Because depending on your source and depending on your method of distribution, 
Um, those are entry points where human pathogens can be introduced and cause a food safety liability or risk for your operation. So looking at production water, um, that could include a number of different um, production methods, such as irrigation, fertigation, um, water mixture, where you're incorporating that water into um, other sprays for dust abatement. And so all of these factors are things that we would need to consider in terms of the agricultural water um, provisions. So when we're looking at the risks that are associated with this water, um, one of the key things that um, we have to consider, again, is where that water is coming from. Whether it's coming from a public water supply or a municipal facility, whether we're working with groundwater or surface water. Depending on where that water is coming from will impact the testing frequency that is required based on the produce safety rule. Um, looking at agricultural water, again, it's important to consider the application method because the application method, depending on what you're looking to grow, will impact whether or not that water directly contacts the harvestable portion of that edible crop. And the third consideration is the timing of the application. And we'll discuss this a little bit more, but that timing of application, depending on how close it is to your actual point of harvest, uh, will determine the microbial risk associated um, with that water quality. So looking at the probability of contamination, again, um, we're primarily looking at three sources here, um, public water supply, groundwater, and surface water. The risk of contamination large, largely dependent here, based on the produce safety rule, on the amount of environmental control that is associated with that water source. Municipal water, especially because it's drinkable, you generally would see no risk assuming that their municipal facility has indicated that there's not a, um, a boil warning or some other um, risk that's associated. Um, for groundwater, um, it's generally a little bit more controlled than surface water, where there are a number of other entry points for microbes and pathogens to be able to come in contact with that water source. So, how do you start thinking about, as we've already discussed, where you get the water from? How do you start looking at preventing contamination for that water? So for public water supplies, um, the municipality that you would be working with generally already um, works through um, cleansing the water of microbes and pathogens because it's drinkable. Um, for that water, um, they should actually be able to provide you with a certifi certificate um, on um, the level of food safety or the level of um, kind of municipal um, practice that they engage to make sure that that water has a low or no microbial risk associated. If you do have any concerns with your public water, though, it may be helpful to test it anyway, just so that you have a backup information and um, you're able to kind of fall back on your own records as well. Um, if there is any um, situation where the municipality is not able to um, adequately clean the water, it may also be helpful to have a backup plan as to how that water would be distributed, um, whether that water would be um, switched from overhead irrigation to some other means of application, uh, just to make sure that it doesn't touch um, or directly contact the harvestable portion of your covered produce. So when you're looking at preventing contamination from groundwater sources, um, when you're looking at groundwater in particular, um, drawing it from a well, the walls themselves should be inspected regularly to make sure that they are maintained in adequate and good condition. Um, when we're thinking about this, um, it may also be helpful to just make sure that the um, well is properly capped and elevated so that there's not any slopage um, toward, the toward the well um, and otherwise prevent contamination from um, backfill or backflow, excuse me. So surface water is a little bit of a different beast here because all access points for surface water are out in the open for the environment. 
So as you're looking at surface water in terms of agricultural water production, some other areas that you might want to consider are um, whether there is wildlife that is nearby that could easily access the water. Um, that wildlife may have um, a risk of feces or may have other um, pathogens associated um, with their access. Um, you may want to look at where that water source is located up or downstream from other composting operations or ranches so that there's also less of a risk of runoff um, from agricultural operations as well. And in working with your um, nearest Natural Resources Conservation Service Center, um, they may also be able to help you in identifying um, areas for um, setting up riparian buffers or other sources to help mitigate that risk of potential contamination um, to your agricultural water if you're pulling your water from a surface water source. But it's also important to consider that there are things that we've never thought of. There is always that what if that could happen. And so keeping an open mind and regularly testing your water becomes a key part of not only just your operation, but also your long-term strategy as an agricultural production operation. So we've already started discussing a little bit about preventing contamination to surface water. Um, again, it's helpful to assess where that water source is based on nearby land use and whether um, there are upstream water activities that could pose a contamination risk and work with your, your neighbors to address those risks, pull from other water sources if you think that there could be a risk, if that's an option and identify um, and monitor and control access to that source wherever practical. So as we've discussed, um, there are a number of different ways to pull your water from. Um, now we're looking at your method of actual distribution. So when we're talking about irrigation, um, there are three different ways for irrigating an agricultural water that could be considered. Um, the first is overhead. And overhead, again, is going to be a higher risk because there is a higher likelihood of external touch points to um, impacting um, and contaminating that water. Um, there's also more of a high risk, or excuse me, a higher risk, because there's a higher likelihood, generally speaking, that that water will directly contact the harvestable portion of that covered produce. So the next irrigation type to consider is flood. It could be surface or it could be furrow. And in that, you may be able to avoid that direct contact with the produce to help limit what that risk is. Um, if there is a, especially if you're going to be growing something like um, squash or something that has a, um, is, is a root vegetable where that regularly touches the ground during its produce um, development cycles, um, flood surface or flood furrow irrigation may still have a higher risk as well. So again, that depends on what your growing operation is and looks like. Um, the last um, irrigation uh, method that we would generally consider is drip irrigation. And so drip is traditionally going to be the lowest risk in irrigation that you'd find because the produce generally doesn't contact that irrigation uh, distribution except for root crops. So in talking about um, agricultural water examples in your growing operation, um, we have another ex example here about a citrus growing operation and this um, farmer wanted to use um, drip irrigation. So the question here is whether or not um, that irrigation method would count toward agricultural water? And so the, the answer to that is no. Um, so because drip irrigation is not likely to come in contact with that harvestable fruit, um, it wouldn't be considered agricultural water. But if there is a breakage in the line, if you start seeing flooding or sprays, then these are um, elements that you might want to consider to make sure that these situations can be controlled or if they can't be necessarily controlled because accidents happen at the very minimum that they be documented so that that um, situation can be resolved 
and um, quarantined if there is any issue of food safety risk. So the next question that we have is, um, again, this farmer is looking to grow um, carrots for their operation, and they are also intending to use drip irrigation. And so looking at whether or not this distribution method is agricultural water, um, the answer to that would be yes, because that water is likely to come in contact with that covered produce, even though drip irrigation is being used. So as we've hinted toward in this, uh, the less contact that that harvestable portion of the crop has with the water, the lower the risk is. So if water is applied using a direct water application method, kind of we have to start to think about what the risk is. Now, if the answer is never, then there's a very low risk. But if the answer is yes, then there are other factors that we might want to consider, such as kind of the timing of when the application is in relation to the water being harvested, um, where um, that, ap that application is maintained, and the frequency. Because as we are looking at timing in particular, um, pathogens on produce can actually die off over time. And so as we're looking at application in relation to harvest and post-harvest, um, there are environmental conditions that can influence what we consider the die-off rates for those microbial risks or those pathogens. So some of that could be sunlight. Um, ultraviolet radiation or irradiation, excuse me, plays kind of a key role here as this time and temperature and humidity. Um, there could be good bacteria um, on that produce that help to compete with those microbial risks and um, starve them out or um, otherwise quote unquote eat them in the process. But there are some pathogens that could be protected on the plant despite the um, frequency or infrequency of the water application. And so that's all something to consider in terms of agricultural production distribution. Um, if there is a question on the method of distribution, I mean, the general um, recommendation is to look at the lowest amount of direct contact that um, is practical given the circumstances. And as we're looking, no matter what distribution method you're using, it's always a good idea to inspect the water source that you're coming from, as well as the actual distribution uh, system itself. Um, now, water can be contaminated at the source, or it can be contaminated in the distribution system. So as part of the Food Safety Modernization Act rule, um, the rule actually requires um, producers to map out what their water distribution systems look like and to assess and inspect those sources and distribution systems at least annually. Um, there are some additional testing requirements in terms of water sources um, that we'll get into in just a second. Um, but when you're looking at um, the general kind of touch points uh, for your water source, um, the rule does require you to be as vigilant as possible in making sure that the sources are free of debris and of trash, domesticated animals, and other hazards to microbial that um, could incorporate microbial risk. So as we try to evaluate what that water quality is, um, what the Food and Drug Administration calls us to look at is what we consider a microbial water quality profile. Um, you may hear it referenced as MWQP for short. Now, testing, especially as we're looking at pre-harvest water distribution for agricultural water, is the only way um, that we can really take a substantive look at evaluating what the microbial quality of that water is. Um, now, there's a threshold that is associated with this, but the water quality profile should be referenced as a long-term um, strategic or in your long-term strategic plan so that you can um, assess that water quality um, in your landscape, as well as potentially identify um, other water quality sources or other contingencies that you could use to um, put what water, qual or what water sources you have um, under the uh, microbial risk threshold 
that is um, the minimum for FDA's requirements. So as we're talking about what those thresholds are, um, the Food and Drug Administration um, sets specific numerical geometric mean thresholds as well as um, standard threshold values in terms of the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule. So looking specifically at the microbial risk, um, the produce safety rule uses generic E. coli as the baseline standard. Now the idea here is that there could be pathogens that are associated with the water source um, that where generic E. coli is not directly referenced, but in identifying the uh, threshold for E. coli in the water, um, you can at least use it to assess, as we see here, um, in terms of um, fecal coliforms or total coliforms, um, there's a higher likelihood or, or general likelihood that you'd be able to at least get a sense of whether or not there's other microbial risk or pathogens that could be um, visible in your water. So as we um, apply that water um, and uh, the water quality criteria, um, each source of the water, um, whether it's groundwater, surface water, it, for municipal water production, it does, doesn't necessarily apply here because your municipality um, tests it themselves. But for groundwater and surface water directly, um, that source of production um, should contain 126 or less colony forming units, what they consider CFU of generic E. coli per 100 milliliter water uh, geometric mean. Um, it should also have 410 or less colony forming generic E. coli per 100 milliliters of statistical threshold value. Now there are, the good thing is you don't have to figure that out on your own. There are testing sites um, across the country that may be able to assist um, in determining what those thresholds are. So as we look at the geometric mean and the statistical threshold values, um, it's important to consider that as you provide those testing sites um, with your water samples, and the, they will be able to help you identify how to apply the water standards, um, the water testing, excuse me, as well as um, potentially even working with your county extension office who may also be able to help you with the water um, sampling processes. Um, there are YouTube videos as well to assist throughout this process. But as you get um, all of these numbers back from your testing site, um, there are models both online as well as in Excel um, from the University of California, Davis, as well as the University of Arizona um, that will do with all of this math for you so that you don't have to worry about calculating the log scale or the standard, the statistical threshold value. Um, as long as you have um, the test results themselves, you can apply and just plot that information into those systems and they'll be able to calculate that. So um, we'd, I'd encourage you to check those out. And if you have any questions um, about where those are located, um, please, um, let us know and we'd be happy to provide that link for you. So those are the thresholds. The requirements for the frequency of the testing um, also differ based on where you're getting that water from. If you're working with the municipality for your water supply, they'll be able to provide you copies of all of their test results. And so just keep those test results on or the and appropriate documentation that you get on file as a reference point in case there's any question about your water. If you are working with a ground source, um, the rule requires an initial test of four or more samples during the growing season or over the period of a year. And then once you get that initial um, water sample, um, then the rule only requires one sample on a rolling basis um, every year um, 
it generally, um, this is something that could happen um, or that you could do um, as you were starting your growing season um, to just get a sense of where your water is at for that season. For surface water, because there are more touch points and because there is a higher risk, um, the rule requires 20 or more tests over a two to four year period. So if you span that out across the four years, that would be five tests um, per year. Um, if you, for whatever reason, condense that to a two year period, then it would require 10 initial tests per two years just to allow you to get a baseline. And then the rule after that baseline is established um, requires five or more samples rolled into the profile every year thereafter. So that's looking ahead. Um, again, the, um, the Food and Drug Administration has um, postponed compliance dates um, based on your um, annual produce sales. Um, but it's generally a good idea to just get a sense of what your water quality profile is now. Um, for people who are currently testing their water, um, the Food and Drug Administration encourages you to continue doing so. Um, if you're not testing now, um, it may be a helpful um, process to get started. And it also keeps you aligned with USDA's good agricultural practice standards. If you get a baseline now, um, you'll be in that much of a better stance and, and situation to help develop water management strategies and to assess what those risks are over a longer period of time. So how do you actually collect the samples? For um, surface water, it's generally recommended that you pull the sample um, as close to you, where you pulled the water from for agricultural water as possible. Um, for groundwater, um, it's recommended that you look as close to where um, the water would be applied um, from either the well itself or from um, kind of the irrigation system. Um, if you have a, a, a chlorinator that is associated with, their, with your house, um, please, it's generally recommended not to pull that water sample um, from your home because the water would otherwise already be treated. And so your microbial risk profile um, would not truly be identifying um, what the pathogenic risk is associated with the agricultural water in practice. Uh, for municipal and public water supplies, there is no sample that is required because, again, the municipality takes care of that. Now, how you collect the samples, um, depending on, um, on where you, you are working with to conduct that evaluation, um, they should have instructions for you. Um, there are YouTube videos as well, and your um, county ag extension office may be helpful in um, providing some tips or instructions. Um, generally speaking, um, the first thing that you don't want is you don't want to contaminate the bottle that you're using to collect the sample. So it has to be sterile. Um, please don't rinse the bottle out because that introduces another water source to the mix and could skew what your results are. And no matter what your distribution system is, allow the water to run a little bit so that you can flesh out the system before taking a sample so that you're able to adequately collect a representative sample of that water. So the next question, of course, would be where do you go for testing? Now, in that, um, the Food and Drug Administration has a um, specific um, EPA rule that they initially referenced as a, a baseline um, for that testing. Um, but there are other standards that can be applied um, to this system um, or other testing that can be done to make sure that you're in compliance with this rule. Um, the Food and Drug Administration has um, a list that is available um, and we can make sure that that list is provided to you um, following this webinar.
the important thing to consider here is that the results be quantifiable so that you can align those results um, with the geometric mean and the standard threshold values and calculate that data in a way to be compliant with this rule. Um, now, the lab certification is recommended, um, but it's not a requirement in the Food Safety Modernization Act because there's a general understanding that there may not be um, certified labs in every area where there is an agricultural operation. So if you do um, find a situation where your water quality profile um, exceeds the thresholds that are allowed under this rule, it's not necessarily the end of the world because there are corrective measures that can be taken to put you in compliance um, and to make sure that we're reducing microbial risk um, with your covered produce. So the first is to apply a time interval for microbial die-off. Now the general rule here is that you have up to um, four days um, after the last test um, before harvest um, for that microbial die-off to take place. And it's not something that um, the, the calculation threshold for that is not something that you need to do outright because the um, online assistance or aids as well as the Excel spreadsheet that I referenced from the University of California Davis as well as the University of Arizona um, will be able to help break that down for you and directly identify what those number of days are. Um, if there is, if or if you, the, the test results indicate that it is of greater than four days, um, it may be helpful to consider um, selling the produce to a commercial washing plant or other facility so that it would no longer necessarily be eaten directly raw. There could be a kill step that's associated with that. And we can get into that a little bit more during our discussion on harvest and post-harvest water. So the next is um, for looking at corrective measures writ large is to make sure that you're continually inspecting and re-inspecting the water system to identify problems and make sure that you're um, installing necessary changes where you can to confirm that this issue is being resolved. And again, document, document, document where there is an issue and the steps that you've taken um, to address those corrective measures to make sure that you have a, um, a backup in case there's ever a question about your production methods or um, your water quality standards. And the third is um, slightly more costly, um, but if you can, um, another corrective measure could be generally to treat the water um, with chlorine solutions or other um, sanitizing devices, sanitizing aids. Um, if you're using an aid, just make sure that you're following what those instructions are and documenting that use accordingly. So again, looking at corrective measures, the risk from the production water can be reduced by maximizing the time between that last application and harvest. Um, that corrective measure um, requires a die-off rate of 0.5 log per day. It's important to make sure that um, your water, that your initial water quality profile does not meet the geometric mean and the standard threshold value criteria. And those aids would be able to help you measure and identify where you are um, in that process as you develop that baseline. So as you're looking at inspection and other corrective actions, if there is a problem, be cautious until you know more. Um, if you think that there's a problem, it may be helpful um, to change your application method so that there's less of a direct contact or no direct contact if possible with that harvestable portion of the crop. Um, which would remove that water distribution from our consideration of agricultural water. Um, we otherwise recommend that you use corrective actions that address contamination sources under your control, keeping in mind state, county, and federal regulations, and implement strategies to prevent future contamination from happening, such as um, fencing off the water supply if possible, um, making sure that you're able to control um, other risks and other um, access points to that water source.
to the extent that you, is practical. And again, as we're looking at treating production water, um, any chemical or non-chemical treatment um, must be effective at making the water safe and of adequate sanitary quality. And you should avoid water treatments that may have negative environmental and water quality impacts if possible. And in all of these practices, make sure that you're keeping records of the treatment um, that you're engaging. So unintentional water contact. Um, what happens if you're using drip irrigation and that distribution method uh, fails or breaks down or floods? Um, some things to consider are what you already know about the quality of the water. And this is where that baseline becomes all that much more important. And how close your application of that water is to harvest um, following that kind of geometric mean and that log for uh, calculation for the standard threshold values as appropriate. Um, we understand that there are human mistakes. Um, you may accidentally spray um, untreated surface water um, to your produce or forget to turn off irrigation pumps. Um, in the event that those things happen, make sure that they're being documented and you can respond accordingly based on where it is to harvest, um, whether or not you're dealing with covered produce or raw agricultural commodity. If there is a flood event, um, it's considered, your, the, the produce that you'd be working with is considered adulterated and cannot be used for food unless you are working with a um, commercial washing or some other um, issue. Even then, there may be some additional um, red flags to consider. And so keep that produce quarantined to the extent that you can and um, in work with your county extension agency. Um, if you have any question about food safety, um, provisions in terms of general application, um, we're more than happy to um, talk with you about that more directly as well. So as you're developing your microbial water quality profile, this is information that we've already covered, but it helps to get a sense of where it falls in terms of the broader system. So again, for surface water, you have to establish that initial water quality profile of at least 20 samples over two to four years. Um, annually after that, um, the rule does require at least five samples for analysis um, throughout that growing season. But most importantly, if you think that your water source has changed for whatever reason, if there is the, an introduction of a new or a different um, component for your water source, um, the rule requires you to set up in a new profile and develop another baseline of 20 samples over that two to four year period. If your microbial water quality profile exceeds that geometric mean or that standard threshold value criteria as soon as practicable, but no long, later than the following year, um, the rule does require discontinuing the use of that water unless you're able to apply an appropriate corrective measure. So the same would apply for groundwater, um, but the again, the testing requirements for that are different. Um, for groundwater, because it is slightly more of a controlled environment, the rule only requires four initial samples over one year to develop that baseline and then one sample annually after that during the growing period. So as you are looking at evaluating risk for agricultural water, um, we've got a couple examples to consider. So the first question again is what is your water source? If your water source is from surface water, um, the next question that you want to consider is how you're applying that water. If you're using an overhead method, it's a, it has overhead irrigation has a much higher likelihood of coming in direct contact with that covered produce. And so the next question that you might wanna consider is when you're applying that water. If you are applying it near harvest and we're consolidating all of these components together, um, you're generally at a much higher risk of um, 
excuse me, of microbial agents in that water source. As another example though, if you're using surface water and you already have that baseline established and you're using drip irrigation, which is not directly coming in contact with the harvestable portion of the crop and it's not near the harvest, um, your level of risk for that agricultural water is going to be much lower otherwise than what we saw in that last example. Now, as we're talking about the Food Safety Modernization Act, and as a general um, good agricultural practice, um, record keeping here is key. Um, record keeping is crucial to making sure that you are able to document the findings of your inspections for your water systems annually. So if there's any question about your compliance with the produce safety rule, you have it in writing that these are the steps that you've gone through, um, these are your findings, these are the water test results, so that you build a collective picture of what um, your operation looks like, um, particularly here as it we're talking about agricultural water, and you're able to pinpoint where those potential areas of risk are, and what you and your operation have done where practical to address those risks and mitigate some of those concerns. So agricultural water is a little, it's, it's different than what we would generally consider um, in, in some ways water for agricultural operations writ large because there are uh, specific components that are associated with this, whether the water again is touching covered produce, um, where that water source is coming from, but agricultural water has been implicated in foodborne outbreaks particularly associated with fresh produce. And so it's something that you would want to watch out for and to be mindful of in your operation cycle. So knowing the water quality profile through long-term testing though, will help you to establish management practices for the appropriate use of the water. Now, if the water is not applied by a direct application, that risk is lower as well as if you extend the time between the last application of the water and your harvest, that also reduces the risk because then you start facing um, microbial die-off rates. Treating the water, if you can, is an option to reduce risks, but there are other um, corrective measures that you can take. Um, as you're developing that initial baseline for your microbial water quality profile, as well as annually thereafter, um, please make sure that you're keeping records and backup copies of those test results. Um, the online and the Excel spreadsheet um, are good ways for you to be able to document that on a um, consistent basis. However, it may also be recommended to um, keep a backup copy in case something happens to that initial. If you operate on a, um, a calendar system, for example, um, writing that your test results into that calendar um, would allow you to re-enter that information into your systems in case um, something happens where you accidentally delete that Excel form or no longer have access to that web-based portal and document all water management practices to the extent that you can and to the extent that you're able to recognize what's going on. And so all of these um, provide a, um, a more robust way of ensuring that you and your operation are um, documenting agricultural water risks as well as what practices are being undertaken um, to mitigate those challenges. So thank you for, again, sharing your time with us. Um, I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions that you uh, might have in terms of agricultural water or the um, produce safety rule. Uh, my email is jwg012 at uark, U-A-R-K dot edu. Again, that is jwg012 at uark dot edu. And, um, so thank you again, and I hope that you all have a great day.